everybody, welcome back to part two of the lecture on the urinary system. So with that in mind, let's dive on into this thing and see if we can finish it up in a relatively quick manner. All right, so there are hormones that are involved in your urinary system that are very important to you. Uh, three of the main players here are aldosterone, atrial natriuretic hormone, and what's called antidiuretic hormone. By the way, diuretic means um, diuresis, I should say, is go into the bathroom to uh, make lots of urine. So antidiuretic hormone would be to slow that process down. So this is one of the ways you got to think about this. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so aldosterone is considered a salt retaining hormone. This is going to be related to renin. So when uh, renin is in the system, it's going to stimulate your um, adrenals, I think it is, to make aldosterone. And what aldosterone does is it affects the kidney and causes the kidneys to hold salt. Now, again, you got to think about this. Water follows the salt. Water follows the salt. So wherever the salt is, the water's going there. So if you're holding salt in the kidneys, well, guess what? That means you're gonna be keeping water. And if you're keeping water, that means you're gonna have less urine output. Uh, this is good old fashioned basic osmosis. So we're gonna transport salt into the body, specifically in the kidneys, and that means that we're gonna hold more water, less urine. You're gonna make less water, or geez, this is tough. You're gonna make less urine because you're holding more water because you're keeping the salt. That'll do, that'll do. Reducing urinary output. All right, antidiuretic hormone is also gonna decrease urinary output, but it's gonna do it in a slightly different way. Uh, antidiuretic hormone is gonna be made in the pituitary gland, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna cause the collecting duct to become more permeable to water. It's actually a really fancy process. Uh, your collecting ducts, it will cause the cells there to uh, place aquaporins, these channels for water, uh, in the area. And what this will do is it'll trigger the collecting ducts to take up way more water than they would do otherwise. So by making the collecting ducts really good at taking up water, that means that they're gonna really concentrate the urine down. And by really concentrating the urine, it decreases general urine output. So instead of having a bunch of really dilute urine, large quantities, you're gonna have very little highly concentrated urine as a result of antidiuretic hormone, lowering urinary output. And then of course there's natrial, uh, natrial dyslexia, man. Atrial natriuretic hormone. Uh, this is going to be released by the atrium specifically, uh, the atrial myocardium and the heart, and when blood pressure is high. So if blood pressure is high, uh, the atria are stimulated to make atrial natriuretic hormone. And this actually does a whole host of things, but the long story short of it is that the body excretes more salt. More salt stays behind in the urinary stream and water follows the salt. So if you're venting more salt through the urinary tract, that means that you're gonna be putting way more water into the urinary tract. That means that you're gonna be producing a very dilute urine. What that means is there's gonna be more urinary output. Okay, more urinary output. And uh, the long story short of this is, it's a way of bringing blood pressure back down as a result of blood volume variances. Uh, water absorption. Yeah, so this is a breakdown of sort of what I just said. So we're talking about this nephron loop. We're talking about the collecting ducts. So reabsorption of salt. Aldosterone causes you to retain salt, and again, as a side effect, you keep the water, uh, decreasing urinary output. Uh, you reabsorb water due to the solute gradient seen typically in the renal medulla. So this medulla is very salty, so when fluids are running through here, they tend to pull water out of the renal tubules. Again, that's the goal of having this really salty medulla. Uh, again, the solute gradient is very important here. Anterior, I'm sorry, antidiuretic hormone is going to be used um, in the collecting ducts then to cause the intake of more fluids. So if you've got a good salty medulla and you've got uh, antidiuretic hormone in the system, that means you're gonna have a really absorptive collecting duct, which is important uh, for maintaining urinary output. And then again, the last but not least, as we discussed previously, we have this atrial natriuretic hormone. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna cause you to uh, decrease your blood volume and bring blood pressure back down and further uh, ANH, atrial natriuretic hormone. This inhibits aldosterone, so it has a double effect, if you will. Now, what I really want to talk about here is the effect of antidiuretic hormone when drinking alcohol. So, interestingly, alcohol is an antidiuretic hormone inhibitor. Okay, so that means that when you're drinking alcohol, antidiuretic hormone does not trigger the collecting duct to take up excess water. Now. What do you know about someone that's been drinking a lot of alcohol? What do they have to do constantly? Indeed, 
or go into the bathroom a lot because when you're drinking you produce copious quantities of dilute urine so the recommendation is that if you're going to drink you make sure you drink lots of water because otherwise you're going to become dehydrated and that can become a problem all right stay safe uh transport maxima so i've already kind of mentioned this a little bit but i'll mention it again as fluid is pumped into this bonus capsule via this glomerulus lots of materials are going to become glomerular filtrate okay bad stuff like uh, nitrogenous waste are going to become glomerular filtrate lots of water is going to become glomerular filtrate some salts will become glomerular filtrate and important nutrient molecules like glucose are going to become glomerular filtrate the idea is that we very quickly want to take all that stuff back up fast as we can now, how do we take up, for instance, sugars, glucose, uh, that are making their way through the kidney tubules? Well, we have transport proteins that are gonna be actively transporting these nutrient molecules back into the bloodstream. This is tubular reabsorption. We're taking back up the stuff that we wanna keep, but there is a limit to the amount of material that these transport proteins are capable of moving and diabetes is going to play a role here so our blood sugar uh, when you're at rest should be between 70 maybe 80 milligrams per deciliter after you've had a couple donuts it should be up a little over 100. Um, a person who is diabetic it can be up over 200. once your blood sugar levels reach about 220 milligrams per deciliter you have reached what we call the transport maximum of your uh, transport proteins seen in your kidney tubules in other words, once you hit 220, there is so much sugar in the glomerular filtrate that as it's flowing through, the transport proteins are not capable of taking up the amount of sugar that's there. The, the amount of sugar is just too much. So those transport proteins are pulling out as much as they can at the highest rate possible, um, but that's not enough. So glucose begins to leave the kidneys via uh, the urinary stream. Let me say that again. Glucose starts to leave as urine. If glucose is leaving as urine, it's going to act just like the salt here, folks. Water is going to chase that solute, and what that's going to do is a person who is di uh, diabetic, who has reached their transport maximum, is going to really dramatically increase their urinary output. And again, we've already talked about this, so I'm not going to harp on it endlessly. Uh, but the idea is that the urinary output changes because you've played with the solute balance in the urine, you've outran the transport maxima of the kidney itself. So you're gonna be venting large amounts of very dilute urine containing a lot of glucose. In fact, uh, it's getting a little gross, but uh, the idea is that in the past, there have been doctors who would smell and or taste urine in order to determine if someone had diabetes or not because the urine would have a sweet taste or a sweet smell as a result of all the glucose leaving via urinary output. Gross, but luckily today we have test strips. Way easy, okay. Is that everything off of this? I think it is. Okay. Uh, filtration breakdown. So your proximal convoluted tubules pull about 65% of the glomerular filtrate and put it right back into your paratubular capillary beds. This happens very, very quickly. So you make the glomerular filtrate and immediately that stuff's gonna have transport right back into the bloodstream. Um, a lot of this is gonna be linked to the movement of, of salts. So when you pull salt back into the kidney, uh, into the medulla specifically, you're gonna be pulling a lot of water too and a lot of things follow that. Uh, the nephron loop reabsorbs another 25% of that filtrate. Again, it's got that vasa recta on that nephron loop, and it's going to be constantly pulling materials out. There's going to be a lot of tubular reabsorption happening there, active transport, pumping things back into the blood supply. The distal convoluted tubule is still going to be reabsorbing materials like sodium and chloride ions, uh, water under hormonal regulation, specifically, as we discussed aldosterone and anti, uh, or I'm sorry, atrial natriuretic hormone. Uh, we will also extract things like drugs, specific waste, and some solutes, and actively pump them back into the urinary stream. This is that tubular secretion that we discussed previously. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the extent of it. So your distal convoluted tubules are going to complete the process by uh, pulling water out and concentrating down the urine. But the idea is that once this urine or this urinary filtrate, if you will, has reached the distal convoluted tubule, what's gonna be urine is urine, okay? Uh, once it's gone through there, once it hits the collecting duct, it's urine. And all the collecting duct does is pull out the excess water. Yeah, 
So all the collecting duct does is pull out the excess water. All right, so your collecting ducts are incredibly numerous, and they're going to connect to lots and lots of uh, nephrons, as we've discussed previously. And what this is going to do is it's going to give these medullary pyramids a classic stringy appearance. And that stringy appearance is a result of all these collecting ducts tunneling their way down to form these lower papillary ducts. All right, the papillary ducts are going to be some uh, just packed with collecting duct ends. They're going to dump into your minor calyces. Yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. I, let me just run you through this real quick. It's on my mind. So you've got the nephrons up here in the kidney cortex. So the nephrons are going to be containing a glomerulus, so the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, lupa Henle, distal convoluted tubule, collecting duct, collecting duct, collecting duct, collecting duct, all terminating in one of these papillary ducts, dumping into a minor calyx. A couple minor calyxes make a major calyx. Major calyces come together to form a renal pelvis. Renal pelvis exits via a ureter. Yeah. Ureter down to the bladder, bladder out via the urethra. All right, all right, I think that'll do. So what do we want to talk about now? I believe this is a ureter conversation. So this is interesting. It's a bifid um, urinary tract here. So we have a, a duplex kidney, which is kind of cool. These are neat. Uh, this is just a situation where, for whatever reason, during development, the kidney forms up as two separate units internally. So you can see that there's like an upper part and a lower part, and they are not necessarily connected. Uh, there's no problem with this. It's actually a relatively common. And people just find out about it randomly. Like you'll go in for some sort of random scan, and doctor's like, oh, look at that. You've got a duplex kidney. It's a totally normal thing, and folks don't even notice it in almost every case. Uh, but it is a real thing. That's a real thing. Normally, you would have a kidney, a kidney, a ureter, a ureter connecting at the bladder. One, two, three openings. Two from each, or one from each ureter, and one for the uh, urethra coming out. So again, remember that trigon of the bladder. We'll be talking about that again in just mere moments. Uh, so the ureter, the ureter here is about five millimeters in diameter. They're way smaller than you'd think, right? Go find your ruler and look what five millimeters looks like. They are quite, quite small indeed. Uh, when you see them on a microscope slide, oh man, I think I might have that. Hang tight. <clears throat> All right, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a microscope slide of a ureter and it's shrunk up because it's a microscope slide. But can you see the tiny dot? I hope you can. Tiny, tiny little dot. Ureters are small, much smaller than you think. Okay, much, much smaller than you think. Five millimeters in diameter, and they are quite muscular. Uh, so it's the classic example of having a mucosa, uh, this muscularis, and then an adventitia on the external surface. Um, is that all I want to say here, really? Yeah, I think, I think that'll do. So these are made out of uh, transitional epithelium, so they're capable of a little bit of stretch. I mean, the bladder is really made out of transitional epithelium, and it's very capable of stretching. But these have transitional epithelium too, and I'll be explaining that here in just a second. But the idea here is that your ureters are very muscular. They've got this muscularis. And then further, the adventition on the outside is quite a strong fibrous layer. And what that will do is it'll allow the ureter to pump materials from one place to the next using peristaltic motion uh, while not really being able to expand very much. So if something tries to move through the ureter itself, it's got to be quite small to be able to pass because the ureter can't really expand because of the nature of this adventitia. Yeah, it's a fibrous connective tissue layer. Yeah, yeah, I think that'll do. Now, why am I talking about uh, things not being able to pass? Well, you can probably guess that we're going to be talking about kidney stones here in just a few minutes. So that's the reference here. That is a reference to kidney stones. Kidney stones must be quite small in order to pass through here. We'll be talking about it. All right, the bladder itself. So the bladder has two sphincters that keep it closed, an internal urethral sphincter and an external urethral sphincter. The internal urethral sphincter is made out of smooth muscle. Ergo, it is controlled by your autonomic nervous system, specifically parasympathetic fibers in this particular case. Uh, and then the external urethral sphincter is going to be controlled by skeletal muscle. And what that means is it's going to be controlled by your somatic motor nervous system. Uh, so autonomic control for the internal sphincter made out of smooth muscle, uh, somatic control for the external sphincter made out of skeletal muscle, uh, and the reason for this I'll get to in just mere moments, 
but the nature of the bladder is that it's internally going to contain lots and lots of rugae, uh, and these are going to be undulations or folds. You can see all these folds here in a collapsed bladder. So when the bladder's collapsed, it's got all these rugae, these, uh, these lines, as you can see here, the sort of inundations and, and the way this is all assembled. And then when the bladder fills, it has the ability to stretch open and be quite large. So the nature of these rugae, these folds, these wrinkles, is that it'll allow the bladder to stretch given the opportunity. And further, the bladder's lining is made out of transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelial cells are quite round on the external surface, uh, but as the bladder fills and stretches, they can become quite flat indeed. So the nature of the bladder containing these transitional epithelial cells is very important for us. Yeah. Yeah, there, uh, the bladder itself has a lot of smooth muscle interiorly, and it's referred to as the detrusor or the detrusor muscle. And the detrusor muscle is gonna be responsible for uh, contracting the bladder and giving you the urge to urinate, and then when you decide to, assisting you in producing a urinary stream. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's talk about how we make said urinary stream. Uh, so the way this works is pretty cool. Uh, and really telling, like if you've ever seen a little kid get the urge to go to the bathroom, like you're talking to the kid, you're like, I, I got three kids, you know. Like, hey, you need to go to the potty? No, 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 everything's fine. Then five minutes later, they go. Like it just strikes them like lightning. The craziest thing you've ever seen in your life drives you up the absolute wall. Uh, but the way this works is very simple, and it makes perfect sense if you understand bodily function. Uh, the bladder will begin to fill. And again, feel free to read this, and it's going to tell you how it happens. The bladder will begin to fill, and as the bladder fills, uh, once it gets to a certain stage, that's going to set out um, autonomic nervous system-based receptors that send a message up to the brain, and basically, or I think it's actually the spinal cord, um, regardless, send um, afferent messages out to say, hey, the bladder is full, and that's going to have a response from the autonomic nervous system, efferent signals back down to the bladder, causing the detrusor muscle to squeeze a little bit and causing the internal urethral sphincter to open. So when the bladder gets full, okay, when you hit a point, a certain threshold, the detrusor muscle is going to be caused to contract and the internal urethral sphincter is going to open. What that's going to do is it's going to push urine out and it's going to hit the external urethral sphincter. And that's going to give you the urge to go to the bathroom. It's going to give you the urge to micturate. Okay, to urinate, to make urine. Um, and then your pons has a, a job to do. Your pons can decide if you're gonna open the external urethral sphincter, if it's a timely uh, moment to go to the bathroom, or alternatively, if you gotta run to the bathroom, uh, you can hold it for a period of time, run to the bathroom, and then tell the pons to release your external urethral sphincter and allow you to avoid the urine from the bladder. Once the bladder loses its general pressure, uh, the internal urethral sphincter will close yet again, and the detrusor muscle will relax yet again, and you will no longer have the urge to urinate. And I'll tell you a little story I think is fascinating. I remember uh, we'd have to drive long distances when we lived in North Carolina to come home. And when you're driving that distance, you know, sometimes it's just not ideal to have to stop and go to the bathroom all the darn time. So one of the things that you notice is, if you're like me and you're wearing a belt, uh, you can loosen the belt and or unbutton that top button on your pants and sort of relax the stomach and keep the pressure from your clothes off of your lower belly and you will uh, lose the urge to go to the bathroom as readily okay so if you're sitting there and you feel like you need to go to the bathroom you can actually loosen your belt or loosen your uh, pants a little bit and that'll take some of the pressure off of the bladder and by relieving some of that pressure the autonomic nervous system uh, will pick this up as a decrease in pressure turn off the mechanisms that give you the urge to urinate and give you a little bit more time to drive before you gotta pull over and make things happen. Uh, so this is a very neat process. So if you had the bladder about half full and you could get in there and give it a good squeeze, it'll give you the urge to urinate. Uh, and then if you let go and let the bladder relax, the urge to urinate would go away. It's all about pressure within the bladder and the autonomic nervous system signals uh, that are sending to and from, kinda neat. All right, renal failure is a state in which the kidneys cannot maintain homeostasis due to destruction of their nephrons. So how do you cause nephron destruction? Man, you can do this in a whole host of ways. Uh, high blood pressure is a really famous one. Putting a bunch of high pressure blood through the uh, nephrons for years and years and years can certainly lead to nephron damage and liver, or, um, liver failure and kidney failure. Chronic kidney infections, impacts from trauma, uh, prolonged low oxygen environments, 
heavy metals are really rough at this too. So certain poisons, man, the kidneys are gonna try to filter that stuff out. This is gonna end up accruing in the kidneys and turning toxic and leading to nephron damage. Uh, let's see, blockages of renal uh, tubules via transfusion reactions. So if you pipe in the wrong blood to somebody, it's gonna cause agglutination, it's gonna be pumped into the glomeruli, it's gonna clog the glomerulus up. Clog up the glomerulus, you're not gonna have urinary filtrate, the kidney's gonna fail. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Osteosclerosis is true, glomerulonephritis is true. Uh, I don't have it on here, but there's another neat one. It's called rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is a situation where uh, you have muscular damage that results in lots of myoglobin. It's a related molecule to hemoglobin, but it's found in the musculature. When you have a bunch of myoglobin from damaged muscles flowing through the bloodstream, which is not supposed to be there, it'll get into the kidneys and block up the glomeruli and lead to kidney failure. So if you get in a car wreck and you have what they call compartment syndrome, this can lead very quickly to kidney failure, which is way worse than losing some musculature. So it's one of those things that we gotta pay attention to. You should look up compartment syndrome. Uh, I've seen that happen, man. It's a dangerous thing. Anyway, moving on. Uh, let's see, nephrons can certainly regenerate uh, after short-term injuries. That's absolutely true. And as you well know, if you have two kidneys and a brother that needs one, you can have one of yours taken out and chuck it in there, provided you guys are adequately similar. And uh, you'll be just fine. You have two kidneys and it's more than you really need. Okay, Your other kidney will actually double in size to take up any slack that's been provided there. Uh, a person can actually survive with very little kidney functioning. Uh, only about one third of one kidney is actually required, as long as you can maintain your general urinary output around 50 or 60 milliliters per hour. However, uh, once you cross the threshold, about 75% of nephrons lost, uh, you will be incapable of producing the appropriate amount of urine. And when you're not making the appropriate amount of urine, you're gonna have build, uh, a buildup of nitrogen in the blood, buildup of urea, what have you. Uh, you're gonna have azotemia, acidosis, that will be acid base balance, pH variances. Uh, also general anemia, when the kidneys fail, you're not making erythropoietin. And if you're not making erythropoietin, then you're gonna turn anemic, you're not gonna have enough red blood cells. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what do we do? Well, in certain situations here, we do hemodialysis. Uh, dialysis is a process of pulling the blood out of the body, cleansing it of waste products, getting rid of anything you need to get rid of, and then pumping that clean blood right back on into the body. Uh, but it's, man, it's a whole lifestyle changing situation is dialysis. It's such a fascinating thing too. Like, imagine not going to the bathroom anymore you're no longer gonna be producing urine. It's just a weird situation. Uh, what will happen is you will uh, go in to do dialysis about three times a week for several hours each trip. They're gonna hook up two large diameter needles into your cardiovascular network. They're gonna pull your blood out. It's gonna run through a machine. Uh, this machine will pump your blood in through the machine, putting it through a specialized tube called dialysis tubing. And the tubing is, um, um, we'll call it selectively permeable, but you get my point, is capable of osmotic and fusionary processes. Uh, the gist of it is that this fluid that uh, the blood is gonna be running through tubules within is gonna be used to pull nitrogenous waste out of the blood, to pull excess water out of the blood, to pull excess salts out of the blood. Uh, imagine this fluid as being like the perfect environment for the body and you're running the blood in a tube through this perfect environment and it's going to balance out any variances that are found within the bloodstream. So dialysis does this process. And worthy of mention here, I suppose, is CAPT, uh, PD, which is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. Kind of a neat thing. What we'll do is we'll open up the peritoneal cavity and we'll flush it with a special fluid and then seal off the opening. Um, this special fluid will sit in your peritoneal cavity and sort of act like dialysis fluid. It's going to take up excess nitrates and anything dangerous, it's nitrogenous waste products, salts, what have you, uh, and that's going to be stored in the abdominal cavity and you'll go in and have your fluid exchange. It's like getting an oil change, okay? Have your fluid exchange, put in fresh fluid, and then go about your daily business. It's going to serve the same role as doing dialysis, just doing it in a slightly different way. But the idea here is the kidneys aren't doing their job, so we gotta use machines to do the job for them. 
uh, kidney stones. So kidney stones are indeed formed from minerals in your urine. Uh, this is especially true, well, I'll get to this all in a second. This is especially true if you're not drinking appropriate amounts of water, okay? You, when you go to the bathroom, public service announcement, let me get up on my soapbox here. When you go to the bathroom, you want your urine to be clear, okay? You want clear urine. If your urine is really yellow or, you know, really, you know, opaque, I guess is the term, like you can't see through it well, uh, you, uh, you got problems. All right, you want to be drinking more water and go into the bathroom more frequently. Uh, you don't, if you feel the need to go to the bathroom, you need to go to the bathroom. You don't want to hold it for prolonged periods of time. Uh, it can cause all kinds of problems with the bladder, all kinds of problems with the ureters, all kinds of problems with the kidneys if you hold urine for too long. And further, again, you want that urine to be clear or you're not drinking enough water. Uh, if, you're, if you have really thick looking urine, man, let me tell you, you are asking for kidney stones, begging for them, begging for kidney stones. So typically, uh, these kidney stones are gonna be caused by a whole variety of factors, dehydration, okay? If you're not drinking enough water, dehydration is gonna cause like a really thick urine in here, and it's gonna be more apt to crystallize. Diets are really high in animal proteins, sodium, refined sugars, fructose, and high fructose corn syrup, grapefruit juice, and apple juice can all lead to this. My wife, who has had a few kidney stones, just chows down on the Cokes, man. She tears into Coca-Cola like it's going out of style. And that is going to trigger kidney stones because guess what she doesn't like to do? Drink much water at all. She has always been dehydrated every day of her life because she just refuses to drink water. Uh, and that leads to kidney stones. It's, it's like if you smoke, you're gonna get cancer. If you don't drink enough water, you're gonna have kidney stones. And they are no fun. No fun at all. Now, typically these will leave via the urinary stream, but if they're big enough, they can cause more problems. Uh, typically a kidney stone is gonna be about three millimeters or less. Um, well, hang on, let me just get into this. So you, you produce kidney stones from time to time, and normally they're so small that they're voided from the system, you never even know they were there, okay? Uh, but if they're about three millimeters or slightly larger, uh, they will cause rhythmic pain unlike much of anything you've ever felt in your life. Okay, uh, yeah, rhythmic, awful pain. Kidney stones are crystalline, so they have sharp edges all over them. So what's gonna happen here is every time a peristaltic wave hits that stone, it's just gonna shred it through the mucosa of your ureter, and it's gonna be tearing into that ureter as it moves down. And it's gonna start out in your back, and it's gonna hurt, and it's gonna move down lower, lower, eventually get it into the genital area. And then eventually you'll dump that off into the bladder and you won't be hurting it as much anymore. And then the process of avoiding it uh, from the urethra is about as fun as it sounds. Uh, it's a little easier than passing it through the ureter depending upon the size, but uh, you can imagine, <laughs> I've talked, I've heard many stories about this from people, never personally experienced it. You can imagine go to the bathroom and then the urinary tract or the urinary flow stops. And you feel pressure build up and then out spits the kidney stone. <laughs> and then things go back to normal. So a weird sensation. Uh, and one of the things you'll notice about kidney stones that'll just blow your mind is how tiny they are. Like you're gonna feel like you're gonna die. It is the worst pain. I've seen it a few times. It is not a fun experience. Uh, and then the, the stone comes out and it's about the size of the ball and a ball um, um, ballpoint pen about the size of that ball right there. So if you got a ballpoint pen handy, look at the end of it. That's about the size of a kidney stone. They're tiny. They are no fun. They hurt real bad. Uh, now, how do we know if somebody's got a kidney stone? Again, you can feel the pain. You can see the nausea, vomiting, and fever. Uh, but what we tend to notice is somebody's coming in with a kidney stone, we think we're gonna make them uh, go to the bathroom. We're gonna test their urine and look to see if there's any red blood cells in there. Real quick and dirty way of diagnosing a kidney stone. Because if that stone's running down the ureter, it's gonna be tearing that ureter to shreds and there's gonna be blood in the urine. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's how that works. Good, let's go here. So urinalysis, man, we can use the urine. Again, here's a nice urine sample containing red blood cells. You can see the red blood cells here, classic example of a kidney stone. We can use urinalysis to diagnose just all sorts of problems with your body. Uh, man, I'm gonna go into more detail when I do the um, lab side of this, but urinalysis is a wonderful tool, just a absolutely wonderful tool. Yeah, so we can look for, for instance, sugar in the urine and be a good way to diagnose diabetes. 
We can look for certain liver enzymes in the urine. It's a good way to diagnose certain liver disorders. Uh, urinary tract infections, we can look for black, uh, uh, bacteria in the urine, the classic cloudy urine. Okay, urine that has a cloudy appearance, it's classic bacteria. Uh, if you wanna know what that looks like, you can go buy an unfiltered beer, kind of give it a swirl and pour it into a glass. Looks just like urine that contains bacteria. I don't know if that's gross or not, but you can look at it and tell. Um, like my girl, oh man, like she was claiming that she was having pain going to the bathroom and I think she was just looking for attention. Uh, but I was afraid that she might have a urinary tract infection. You know, little kids, maybe they don't clean as well as they should. Maybe they clean improperly. Uh, so I take her to the doctor's office. I'm like, all right, well, we need a urinary or a urine sample. So get a urine sample and I take it and I look at it. It's clear as the day is long, nice, clean, clear urine. And all I could think was, why are we here? throw it in the little cabinet they've got, and then they come back and they're like, oh, we should have a urinary tract infection. I'm like, no kidding, no kidding. Anyway, uh, pregnancy is obviously quite easy to diagnose based on certain proteins found in the urine. Drug tests are urinary based. Myoglobin in the urine is a really good way to diagnose uh, that uh, compartment syndrome as we talked about previously leading to rhabdomyolysis. So yeah, urinary tract, based infections, urinary tract anomalies are great ways of testing for whole body system-wide issues. Good, easy tool. You just pull a urine sample, chuck a um, test strip into it, and then examine the test strip. Quick and dirty, simple process. Works like a charm. Uh, and then I've got a nice breakdown of how the urinary system influences all the other systems of the body. Uh, a lot of this is really interesting, like talking about the nervous system and the muscular system. Uh, for those to work effectively, your urinary system has to maintain general uh, blood osmolarity and keep ions in appropriate levels. Uh, geez, let's, the digestive system produces urochrome as a breakdown product of hemoglobin, and that's what gives urine that yellowish coloration that it has. It's all from the breakdown of red blood cells. I mean, you name it, there's so much to talk about. Vitamin D synthesis, as we talked about previously, erythropoietin synthesis, as we talked about previously. Like, there's just so much, all right? There's just so much going on that the urinary system has its hot little hands in. It, it, it's just a very important system. Like, they're all important systems, but your urinary system is fancy, okay? Very fancy. Uh, and that, I believe, is that. So here's another nice image from the body's exhibit. That's a real kidney. You can see a real ureter as it's traveling down. Uh, and this is how this works, man. So I think that's gonna be it. So that's the extent of the urinary system. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, thanks folks.